Welcome to episode nine of the No BS po- Pagan podcast. Tina and I are joined by Björn Ekdal from Sweden tonight. Björn is the founder of the Haminia Foundation and podcast. He runs a very active Discord server. He's also active on Instagram, which is where I first found him. Björn, how are you doing tonight? I'm very fine, a bit stressed after a long week of work, but i um, happy to be here. Great, great. We're really happy to have you on. We've got lots of questions for you. So why don't we just start with how did it all get started for you? When did you become a polytheist? Sure. I am um, I often present myself as... Um, uh, in an Indo-European way, I'll call myself a, a Rex Hadbertor and Demspotis. And uh, Rex means uh, that I'm the, a leader of, of this foundation and uh, and the platform and the podcast. And I'm, that I'm also an entrepreneur and CEO in talent development and employer branding. And the Hadbertor means that I'm a priest uh, performing Indo-European rituals and sacrificial ceremonies on behalf of the Harminga Foundation. And the Demspotis means that I'm a family father and householder. But I have, um, well, it, I mean, it, my, my spirituality has always been there. It was there from the, from the very beginning. Uh, I have a completely different background. I haven't worked with these things before. I um, actually the lion's share of my career. I have been in the Paris fashion industry, working with um, sustainable fashion and luxury. So we're very different from what I do today. Uh, but I, at some point, I asked myself, "What's the most um, purposeful and what really gives me purpose in life?" And I basically fired myself from from that age as head of agency and um, started doing this instead working with youth and talent and then also working with the Harmingya Foundation. So, and when it comes to how I became a polytheist, I always say that we're all pagan by instinct. Uh, that's something you've heard in the on the podcast too. Um, the n- eternal natural order is there no matter if we want it or not, whether we realize it or not. And it's remember to it's important to remember that um, the Indo-European spirituality isn't something else than life itself. So for me, it's always been there, and I've always been a very seeking person. Always wanted to grow and go deeper, reading a lot, asking myself spiritual and existential questions, etc. You know the drill. Uh, but growing up in uh, between Scandinavia and actually southern Spain, I was torn between extreme secularism and a demystified society on the one hand, and on the other hand, deep Catholicism. And neither of them managed to provide me the answers I needed. I never really understood why we either have to neglect the spiritual part uh, and only see the material aspect, or why we have to worship death, or what's beyond death, something separate from ourselves. So I, I've i always done that those studies myself. I, I even studied uh, science of religion at the university before I took another direction. Um, so um, spirituality has always been part of my nature, It's part of my own dharma. And it was when I realized that the meaning of life is life itself, that it is our duty to grow and blossom. That's when I also started uh, seeing this everywhere in nature. And I started looking into uh, the native spirituality of Scandinavia. And that's, yeah, that's the path I'm on. That oh, was a I... long. Uh, that was a long presentation. <laughs> oh, that's that's great. Um, so I I noticed that you mentioned on your website that you <laughs> decided to start this whole thing because you kept making very long, informative comments on yeah. on YouTube, and that's what prompted you to actually make this. You know, the the foundation itself and the Discord server, because. 
you actually have so much knowledge that it's so impressive. Uh, <laughs> the Discord server in particular, I just read it, you know, at night and your answers are just so detailed. Uh, it's really, really fantastic. So when did you start the, when did you start the foundation? Yeah, this is something I can answer in a much, much uh, quicker way, actually. Uh, so just like you say, since I've always been interested in de facto had a lot of um, knowledge about these things, people have always asked me a lot of questions when it comes to these things. Um, not the least pagans online who want, they long for authentic knowledge rather than uh, let me say new age inventions without being disrespectful but um so i basically started like just like you said i i started writing long very long comments on other people's youtube videos and uh, like for example uh, norse magic and beliefs and uh, survive the jive channels like that and i used to write really really long comments on on people's questions etc and um uh, there was someone who asked me if I'd never considered starting my own podcast. And I thought, well, maybe I should. And I did. And then I started the, the Discord community since there was actually a much bigger need than I would have thought. And um, yeah, and here we are. Yes, yes. So we'll, we will drop the links, obviously, to your website and the Discord server underneath Perfect. the video. So people are really interested in authentic polytheism and authentic history uh, neither Tina or I are fans of the new age which is an understatement so we're all mm. about the authentic past which can be hard to find because of the misinformation these days you know the the wokery yeah so what I would like to start with uh, as, as, let me just say that it, it's a good thing that pagan. So yeah, if we should call it paganism, but it's a good thing that it's in fashion, uh, that is in right now, and and uh, that's a good thing. The problem is that people online, especially, they seem to be thinking that anything goes, or that if you just say that there's a blue-haired unicorn somewhere, you can believe in that, and well. They can do that, but I know that for a fact that there's a huge demand for authentic answers. And uh, yeah, so that's great if you share the links too. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so what I would like to start with, which is a really big area for me personally, uh, could you tell us about the Aryan, which... <laughs> is a you know a controversial term in itself it's it's so ridiculous but could you tell us about the aryan invasion of india yes and aryan shouldn't be controversial at all um since well there was an austrian painter who made it controversial but but um in fact it only means noble or noble man or actually someone who is of your own kin and the Indo-European peoples used to call themselves Aryans because they, if we follow this eternal path, then we are noble men and women. Uh, so Aryan just means that those who follow this path, they, they also have to be noble people. And so so shouldn't be very controversial, but maybe it is. Um, this was the Aryans, if we talk about them uh, first of all, the Aryans and the you I think you mentioned the Vedics too. Yes. Um, so that I'll go back in history a bit here. Um the all our oldest ancestors, us who are Indo-European, um they were called we call them rather the proto-Indo-Europeans, the beginning of Indo-European. Um for example, they were the, the foundation of all the Indo-European cultures, and Vedics, Persians, Greeks, Romans, Celts, etc. They lived on the huge grasslands of the Pontic Caspian steppe, north of the Black Sea, actually right where there's a brother war going on right now in Ukraine and Russia. And these peoples had a semi-nomadic pastoralist culture, 
and also a culture of expansion and land taking that was in their nature and culture. And they did this through uh, a youth war band tradition of taking other people's cattle and then settling down there and lighting their own fires there and claiming that land. So with the centuries and millennia, they expanded west into Europe and also south and southeast, uh, most likely via the Caucasian region into what is today Iran and then Afghanistan and Pakistan and finally into northern India. And they arrived there sometime around, uh, what do you say, 1700 BCE. Um, and... Um, Along the way, in every direction, they obviously spread their languages, cultures, and spirituality. And uh, we have to admit that they were quite successful. Almost 50% of the world's population speaks an Indo-European language today as their first language. So that's um, a little uh, short introduction to the Indo-Europeans and the Aryans. Great. So that includes Sanskrit? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Um, so what did they find when they entered India? Who was living there? And uh, how did those people react? That is um, a bit of a, a disputed um, question, or, or rather the answer being disputed. Um, most experts would say that when the Indo-Europeans entered Pakistan and northern India, um, they met a very advanced culture in the in those borderlands, um, and it's called the the so-called Indus Valley civilization or the Harappan civil civilization. Um, a people that had gone from being uh, mountain farmers to now, when at the at the arrival of the Indo Europeans, they had. Big, big urban centers with uh, maybe as many as uh, 60,000 people living in cities. And they also had um, sophisticated technique and infrastructure and an extensive maritime trade network uh, between them and the Mesopotamian civilization. So definitely, according to me and most experts, a very high standing culture, both technically and socially. So that uh, it's not at all that the Indo-Europeans came to a some kind of wasteland or something like that. They 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 came to a perhaps the most advanced culture next to the 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 what do you call them the two river cultures etc. in Tigris and Euphrates. Okay, so could you so it was a quite advanced culture that was already living there, and did they have wars, or did they ass assimilate? Uh, if it? they had wars, is that what yeah. you what you said? Yeah. Yeah. So that's actually a very interesting question. They they certainly did, and 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 most experts say that we people in general didn't have wars at all until we became. Is it? Do you say that you're sedentary? That you're that you're permanently living somewhere? People in general all over the world didn't have organized warfare or wars or much of fights at all until we became sedentary and agriculturalists because before that there was nothing to defend there was nothing to own but as soon as you start with agriculture that's when you have a an area to protect and and uh, assets to protect and that's exactly what had happened to the dravidians or the harappan um civilization they they were actually on a decline when when the Indo-Europeans came there. They had had a lot of internal battles. Uh, they had had a lot of um, sicknesses and diseases. And yes, there were political battles and wars, etc. going on. And that's most likely a result of agriculture. Okay. So would you say then that agriculture, the discovery of or... Uh, would be connected to the Kali Yuga. That's when it all started to go downhill. Interesting. I have never thought of it that way. But yes, I mean, if we look 
time wise that makes sense and uh, because they say that kali yuga has been going on for what is it like five six thousand years or something like that yeah or maybe more but uh yeah so it's a good um good question actually i mean yes definitely um i would say that the healthiest lifestyle culture is to be like the proto-europeans were um semi-nomadic pastoralists uh, um somewhere at the somewhere at the crossroads between being hunter-gatherer and agriculture um that that is according to me the healthiest lifestyle um uh, and, and and yes, agriculture leads to warfare. Okay, so uh, could you tell us the uh, the Dravidian people? Are they they are connected to the modern Indians Indians that live in India? They are. They, they are. are. Okay. Um, I think that nowadays Dravidian peoples are mainly associated with southern india and and maybe sri lanka etc um but at the time of of uh, the arrive, uh, arrival of the indo europeans there were dravidian peoples all over the indian subcontinent and even like i said in into pakistan and afghanistan um and they are of a non indo european ethnicity and they speak and spoke non-Indo-European languages. Um, and the Dravidian language family is indigenous to India. And okay. they um, they originally had um, a purely agricultural and sedentary lifestyle, like I said, unlike the Indo-European peoples. And they had moved down from mountain farming and had started founding big cities, maybe thousand or two thousand years before um uh, so that's that about about their ethnicity and their languages if you want i can elaborate a bit on their religion too and yes culture. please yes so um very simplified one can say that um the 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 dravidian religion or spirituality is the non-Vedic part of today's Hinduism. Hinduism is a large part of Dravidian spirituality and a foundation, let's call it that, of Vedic or Indo-European uh, spirituality. And the Dravidians were very animistic, had a close relation to nature, local spirits protecting the villages, um, and they portrayed the the divine actually as a feminine force was which was very different from the indo europeans and they had a big big focus on a mother goddess as the highest divinity and it is from this uh, feminine and domestic focus we today have the the bhakti movement the extremely pious and devoted orientation of hinduism and the Dravidians also must have been the origin of the very almost monotheistic tendency in today's Hinduism, where you see um, Vishnu, Shiva and Shakti sects that include like 900 million of the Hindus today. So, And they, they basically say that either Vishnu, Shiva or Shakti is the one god and all the other gods are basically just aspects of that god um so yeah so that's a bit about so then that of course had a had a huge impact uh, when when the vedics arrived yes yes i have i have seen you uh write about that one thing i noticed about modern hinduism is that they have a lot of rituals you know the the puja and they yeah. have rituals almost, you know, every day. And um, would you say that the, you know, the Aryan people, their their religious practices were more relaxed? I wouldn't really agree with that. But, uh, uh, well, they, they were both complex in their own way. Um, the Vedic rituals 
sacrificial rituals, offerings, etc., were much, much, much more complex and time-consuming. When while um, the Dravidian, they, they have a much bigger focus on the internal uh, aspect, the the meditative, the reflective uh, path, uh, where salvation comes through um self-realization rather than sacrifice and gift giving and that's one of the biggest differences uh between those two groups um i, I don't know if i'm answering your question but but if yeah. initially um i wouldn't say that that was that the dravidians were more advanced or complex because i would actually that's actually one of the reasons why they started fighting each other and why actually why dravidian culture is more present i would say in india today than than. but that's uh we will move on and i'll come back to that okay uh so how did the vedic religion or beliefs uh influence modern hinduism yeah good um good question um huge influence on the dravidian society culture and religion uh not like I said, not the least since the Dravidian society was already weakened and had peaked way before the Vedics arrived. So the Indo-Aryan society was very hierarchical and um, a very hierarchical social structure called Varna, which means um, true colors. So meaning that every person follows their own dharma, their own um, nature, so to say. And um, they follow their own functions, uh, either as a priest, a warrior, merchant, or producer. And this definitely should not be confused with a much later caste system, because that was a colonial thing. But, uh, yeah, well, it was built upon that Varna system, but uh, it's not the same thing. Um, The Vedic spirituality was also much more focused on like I said, on external practices, um, sacrificial offerings, priestly rituals, prayer chanting, more of a reciprocal gift-giving cycle. And this this had a, a big impact on the Dravidians. It changed their... Um, the, the, the Dravidian spirituality was more internal, pious, devotional. Um, and the Indo-Aryan literature also inspired new narratives, philosophical ideas, ethical principles, um, cultural landscape, etc. And But we also have to add that, on the other hand, that Dravidians had an enormous impact on the Indo-European colonizers too. Um, deities, rituals, myths from both traditions merged and assimilated. Um, so there was, a, there was a syncretism going on. One can say that um, Hinduism hadn't been what it is today without any of those two. Uh, and if we look at India today or the spiritual practice in India today, it's actually correct to say that the Dravidian modus operandi, uh, quote unquote, won in a sense. Uh, much because of, like I said, political battles, but also because of um that the, the people found the Vedic rituals way too complex and expensive. So th- those are some of the differences, and they both had a huge impact on each other. Okay. Yeah. I have a question then. Um, this almost this compulsion, it seems to unify every deity and every godhood into one. As in, as you said, that like all the different gods are actually aspects of one god which then can be different for different groups. But is that in any way linked with the rise of agriculture or is it to just because it's simpler and e- people just drift towards the simplicity of? Um, very good question. That's not really my expertise, but I would say that I, I wouldn't, I maybe there's a connection to agriculture too, but I, I shouldn't speculate about that. I would say that um, it's interesting that we see that the, more time that passes, the more monotheistic societies seem to become. Um, 
I actually haven't really studied why that is, but that seems to be the case. And we see that today with the, the biggest religions being monotheistic and also Hinduism, modern Hinduism becoming very monotheist. Um, sometimes they say that that's, uh, uh, what do you say, like a, like a de defense against uh, external enemies for example it's easier to protect yourself in your own culture if you have one strong um god or or protection and and, and you can also say that the, the, the biggest strength of indo-european culture is its um capacity and ability to adapt because they did everywhere they came but that can also be a weakness that you you're so um um, willing to adapt so you actually become weak so i think it's rather something it has to do with that and you can also see that already around year zero even in india you can see that they they are going towards a more monotheistic uh, culture and uh, you see that in the later texts like the puranas and upanishads that that uh, it, it, it's much more for, there you see really see the dravidian um influence with a internal focus a more centered divinity etc mm -hmm. so again I, I i don't know if i should be too speculative here but but those are some of the the reasons mm -hmm. i see thank you so what about rein the belief in reincarnation there's uh Modern Hinduism, they have this kind of belief where, you know, there's the hierarchy and you start as, you know, something in nature and then you go through animal and correct me if I'm wrong. And you have this kind of eternal loop until you manage to evolve and, and get off the wheel. Was that a Dravidian uh, belief? Because I would say so. I would say yeah. so. Yes. Um, since. Yeah, they had a very strong belief in in an uh, eternal cycle of lives in samsara. Um, the the yeah the eternal cycle of life and lives and uh, and, and rebirth etc. While if we look really really far, far back in the Indo-European branch rather branch rather, uh, um, they didn't really seem to have had. Uh, this belief in reincarnation per se but rather that what there were just parts of you living on not all of you but parts of you lived on some parts went to an afterlife or an underworld and other parts of you lived lived on here in this world forever um, but that also changed a lot with time and with the different the various indo-european branches so that's something that's evolved both in Europe and in in, in uh, India. But to answer your question, I would say that samsara thought of um, eternal rebirth is a Dravidian influence, yes. Yeah, that's something that I've kind of struggled with, uh, you know, believing in my bones to be true. Uh, I kind of feel like we are always human spirits and there is a very strong ancestral connection to with reincarnation would you hmm. say that that would be an indo-european belief i would say that that again indo-european Indo spirituality is nothing other than life and nature and cosmos itself so if we want to understand these things we should always go to nature and what does physics and thermo thermodynamics say it says that you cannot destroy energy you cannot create it it can only uh what do you say it can only uh, be changed into different forms or i don't know how you say that in english but uh you, you cannot neither create nor destroy energy you can just um transform it into different uh, shapes or forms so to say and 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 if we accept the the rules and laws of physics and thermo thermodynamics then we also have to accept the fact that Okay, so let's say that I live right now and I, we accept that we are energy because that's what we are. Uh, I mean, my flesh, even my flesh is energy, right? So if we accept that, then we also accept that if I die or the Bjorn we know today, he dies, 
and someone burns my body so no matter if we believe in the soul etc so if if someone just burns my body this energy will de facto go into something else and it will live forever so if we accept the laws of physics and nature then we also accept that my energy will live on forever but not necessarily as me or the Bjorn we know etc am i answering your question i i am um... yeah yes you, you did and so the indo-european funeral rites uh around that you know the the time of the the vedic people was it solely by fire and that's also a very big question that ha that is something that has varied um all over the Indo-European world and with time that that is not something that has been constant so the the the, the practices and, and traditions around funerals has varied a lot um I, I i it would be wrong of me to say that the the most common is to be uh, burnt on a funeral pyre but on the other hand it is very Indo-European to to have fire as the, the the first priest and the and the main divinity, so to say, fire and and water, and therefore also uh, fire is a shapeshifter. So um, so yes, I mean that that that's that is one very uh, Indo-European tradition, but there were there were many others too. Okay, um, possibly it was connected to the hierarchy, the funeral rites? Possibly. Uh, I haven't studied that a lot, so I, I can't really give you a good answer there. But but yeah, definitely it could. It could be because uh, we see that in India too, that, that it's super important to them and, and it always was to, to be burnt. Um, but yeah, possibly, possibly. Okay, so could you talk a little bit about the hierarchy uh, within the society of the Indo-European peoples? Oh, yes. Um, it was a very hierarchical society already from the beginning with... Um, I, I think that word has a very negative connotation today, which it doesn't necessarily have has to be. I think it's something good because rather than uh, hierarchy, it's it's it was about meritocracy. Is that how you, how you say it? that? It's it was about the those who had the most knowledge and expertise and merits, so to say, or credibility. They were also the leaders. So the French they say noblesse oblige. So the more noble you are the more you have the more you also have to give this is for example why they call the leaders and the chieftains the ring giver because the ring giver the chieftain was the one who had to give the most gold and food etc to the people so i think today there's a negative connotation to um hierarchy and um uh, but it wasn't always and um so it was very hierarchical and there was um, layers. I think it in India today. You, if we're talking about India, you have, uh, or a couple of thousand years back into up until today, they have four different layers of people. Um, but I think I would say that that there were originally three layers of people or in, in structures in society. Um, because three is a number that it goes much better with with original Indo-European culture. So, um, and also I want to say that just because today it also has a, a negative connotation that, for example, if you say that someone in India today is, um, um, for what do you say, a sh like a shudra, um, or um, uh, I have this written down here, um, but. Um, if you, some of the today's casts, they seem to be worth less, but that was never the case. Um, for example, a, a, a surgeon or like a, a doctor would today be considered the lowest caste 
if you if you take the the definition from from um, the old times, so to say. I don't know if I'm making my my myself clear here, but but the, those layers they have um, distorted and and transformed a lot over time. So that it was based on meritocracy and um, and uh, also the deeds you'd done if you were famous for something if you were heroic if you were noble again aria means those who have done something noble and if you sacrificed if you were generous uh, those were also the leaders so uh, truly hierarchical but in a positive sense i would say that today we lack hierarchy we lack real leaders we lack uh, true and good power. And this is something we need to change. And that's something the Humming Your Foundation is working with, actually. Yeah, agreed. It's, it is very similar to the Greek Aristos, actually. It, uh, Sorry. Where the word aristocracy comes from is from the Aristos in Greece, yes. which is also very meritocracy based. It's good that you bring that up because aristocracy has to do with both Arta and Rita, the, the Hindu or the Vedic uh, concepts of natural order. So, for example, art is the same uh, etymological root. Uh, everything that has to do with order and beauty has to do with the original word was Hartus in, in the Proto-European language. So this is the structure or the, the order of cosmos and the eternal natural law. So aristocracy means that the best rule, because that's what's right. That's mm -hmm. simply natural that those who are best and have the best intentions for the people, they also rule. And today, unfortunately, we lack leaders who care about uh, pe our people or our peoples. And um, yeah, that's one of the problems we have today. But it's good that you brought up aristocracy because that that's actually uh, cognate with Hartus and Rita, etc., etc. Mm. So the three the three different parts of the hierarchy, we would have had a priest class. Is that correct? Yes. Or a, yeah. Uh, uh, actually, initially it was uh, uh, um, they call it, in India they call it Chakravartin, and Aristotle and Plato call it the the philosopher king. So the the it was actually the king or the leader was also the main priest. That's how it all started. But yes, a priestly class, um, like what do you say, like a merchant class and a producer class. Okay. Yes, because so even... it has to do with religion and 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 the cosmic order and with war and sovereignty. And then with fertility, that's the the trifunctional Indo-European structure. Yes, I I did notice, uh, you know, reading about people like Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar, that they mm -hmm. were priests of certain, you know, mystery. Um, they were priests of certain gods, and initiated yes. into certain mysteries. And you just look at that and you think how how far we have fallen. <laughs> yeah. There were many, many different kinds of priests too, because in in a true Indo-European society, a priest isn't really a profession or uh, a title. It's rather something. If you if you would say that it's a noun in modern days, it, it would be a verb in the old days. That that the best way we we often say that the best way of being a priest is by acting like a priest. So you. Those who perform the sacrifices, the rituals, etc., they are the priests. And there were many, many different kinds of priests. And in fact, I was actually going to mention that the word God itself stems from uh, geutor in Proto-Indo-European, which means to pour a libation. So those who were godly, or if you look at the Norse mythology or North Norse branch, uh, you you have the Godi, the, the priest was called Godi. That's the same word, comes from Geutor and God, for example. That a, a Geutor is someone who, a one of the priests who pour libation. So his or her function was to pour the libations and invoke the spirits or the gods with libation. That's what actually what God means. 
someone yeah. who had a spirit who has a spirit who has been been invoked with a libation that's what a god is so could you tell us about the root there's a root indo-european language is there a root indo-european pantheon um let me see if i can get my yeah here so i have some keywords here um First of all, absolutely, I will. Uh, first of all, it's important to say that the focus, uh, I was I was talking a bit about that earlier, but the focus on gods and pantheons um, that we have today, that's actually an Abrahamic influence. Um, our ancestors simply viewed all of the world and the cosmos as animate and spirited. Everything had life force, and therefore one also has to stay on good terms with everything in your surroundings. Um, so the Proto-Indo-Europeans and the early Indo-European peoples worshipped spirits of the place, ancestors, heroes, deities, and basically everything around them. Um, there's an old Vedic saying that goes, there's as many gods as there are waves on all the oceans. Uh, and I think that goes all the way back to the protein Europeans. Um, since cosmos expands, so does the amount of gods and spirits. Um, cosmos has to appoint, so to say, managers on every function and force. So the Indo-European gods are born, but they are immortal. Um, so I just want to say that it's it's, it's important not to think too much in the terms of gods and uh, pantheon, because the, the original Indo-European view is that spirits and ancestors was the most important. That was on a daily basis. That's that's basically what they what they worshipped and what they um, who they were trying to appease. Um, but but of course, all all Indo-European peoples. And the Proto-Indo-Europeans had, um, to actually answer your question, is that they definitely had a father sky called Deus Pater. Um, that's cognate with Jupiter and Zeus, etc. Um, that's not very strange that they had a father sky, considering that they were living on huge steps with the sky, sky above them. They uh, had a mother earth. Uh, they had a pathfinder and psychopomp god called Pauson who's uh, cognate with Pan and Faunus. Uh, they had the dawn goddess, Hausos, who is cognate with um, Eos and Aurora and Eostre. They had uh, the striker and lightning god, Perkunos. Sun god, Seul. Moon god, Menot. The half goddess, Vestia. And uh, many, 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 like, uh, again, like, there, there weren't, uh, there wasn't a, like a, a limited number of spirits or gods they were uh, innumerable they even uh, worship places and mountains and rivers lakes etc so um so yeah that that's uh, they, they absolutely i wouldn't call it call it a pantheon that's a later phenomenon but but yeah they they definitely had the gods you see today the strike the strike of the moon the the sun etc yeah, so it's a I get I give offerings to the spirits of the land where I live. I think it's important to to you know to recognize that everything has a spirit. Mm. Um, so is that something that you do in your in your practices today? Absolutely. Like I said, the 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 main Indo-European focus is the spirits around you where you live and the ancestors. That it was actually the you know the 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 origin of an altar is actually that you had a you had an, a hearth in in your home obviously since you were cooking food and you were uh, staying warm etc and on this hearth or actually below this hearth they buried their ancestors and the ancestors were both the spirits of the place and the gods so and they they started putting little uh, figurines on the hearth on the on the mantelpiece and this is the the origin of of an altar 
so there weren't originally any altars or stuff like that they 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 had their hearth and that's where they and th that was the the domestic fire and that's also where they sacrificed to the spirits of the place and to the to the ancestors so so those they were the original gods and that's definitely something if if you call yourself an an animist i often call paganism that that it's animism with some structure and uh and if you're a pagan or you're an animist then if you don't have a good relation with nature and everything around you then then you have a problem and um i mean the greeks and the romans they they had so many rituals you, they couldn't even leave the house without saying goodbye to the threshold uh pouring water to the spirit to this they, they did everything based on the spirits around them and so that's definitely something i do too yes so that's a daily a daily practice for you could you kind it of is. walk us through some of the the rituals that you do with pleasure um if we want a world of order and beauty we have to sacrifice more we have to give more but a sacrifice isn't just some kind of ritual we do it's also about where we put our focus and energy that we do selfless service that we build beautiful families families and our role models to those around us um, you know science was basically laughing at the karmic concept until they discovered epigenetics which shows that our actions have an impact not only on yourself in real time but also on your genes and therefore future generations so we literally rewrite our dna in real time through our actions um so th that's why i say that we need to sacrifice more and that's also why i said earlier that we have to those who have more have to give more spirituality is about uh, growing just like the tadpole wants to become a frog and the rosebud wants to become a rose so the the best sacrifice is to practice uh, or is to to try to get to know yourself and know your true nature and excel in it that's what the greeks called arete which is actually um also cognate with uh, aristocracy that you mentioned earlier um that said um as someone who sees myself as a priest i practice my spirituality at least three times a day i give libations and oblations and chant prayers in the morning lunch and evening um i often say that where there's ash there's honor of course meaning that um where the spiritual laws are kept and sacrifice has been performed there's also good energy and um fire is always central in my in my own practice and like i said fire is our first priest and our main transporter of gifts and words i do a weekly uh thanksgiving ritual to the half goddess vestia or whatever we want to call her um so the, on the on a daily basis it, basis it's a mainly libations oblations into the fire uh, either i do it in my home or i go to a sacred space and i do it on behalf on myself my family and the harmonia foundation uh to create a, a better world uh, then i also keep the eight original indo-european festivals of the wheel of the year and in addition to that i celebrate many many other holidays and perform hundreds of other rituals on behalf of uh, myself and or others it's actually also a very indo-european tradition to sponsor uh, uh, rituals on behalf of your family so i i don't mean that in a in a financial way but in a uh yeah they 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 um they sponsor that they, they, they ask for having a spiritual or uh, ritual performed on their behalf uh and if people want me back on the podcast, I gladly elaborate even more on how these authentic rituals are performed. Yes, yes, we would we would love that. It's been really fantastic just listening to all of this. <laughs> yeah. uh, you're a wealth of knowledge. Any plans <laughs> to write a book? 
And like I said, uh, you opened Pandora's box a bit. So I was afraid I was going to sit here for 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 days and days, and and uh, because <laughs> there's so much to to be said, and I've just uh, scratched the surface a bit here. And um, I I I really want your listeners to understand that we all scoop out of a of the of the same source, the Indo-European. Uh, people all sc scoop out of the same source and there's a wealth of knowledge and there's so many rituals and there's so much to be done that we need to recreate to get out of this Kali Yuga so I'd gladly be of help if anyone wants to contact me or join the discord server um, and you know we haven't even started talking about astrology and astronomy which is your expertise and the Vedics were huge within that the Geotisha and the the Vastu Shastra, etc. They were amazing, amazing. So, uh, and I and I won't go into that <laughs> this time. I think. <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely have a a lot more questions. Um, the the next time that we have you on, there's there's so much. Yeah. To to talk about, it's endless, really. But people that follow Tina and I, they're they're really thirsty for the you know the real knowledge because there's mm. so much fluff and you know, fakery and uh, new age garbage out there that, uh, you know, we could have a six hour podcast with you on and mm. <laughs> listen to all of your knowledge. I think the problem is that right now, paganism, if we call it that, is basically run by Americans. I, I, I don't blame Americans, but I, I, I would say that um, since that that's the main base of paganism today or that's maybe what they want to believe um that also means that is a lot of abrahamic or people having abrahamic glasses on who also drive this this development of paganism uh and that also that's also why i wanted really wanted to stress that we shouldn't focus too much on um gods and pantheons etc but rather about nature and spirits and ancestors um because th what i see online today it's uh basically they, they, they're just changing the names of the gods uh if you understand what i mean that they, they, they are basically practicing christianity or judaism but they just put new names on the gods uh and, and that's a huge problem so it's so important that we teach these authentic ways and actually also teach that the abrahamics uh, stole the traditions of i mean they they didn't even invent um holy water the Catholic, catholics the holy water in the catholic church is a pagan tradition for example so yeah we could go into that for hours too but let's not <laughs> yes so. yeah tina tina has talked a lot about that you know how modern polytheism a lot of it is really just relabeled uh christianity it is. Uh, it's it's it not is. natural the way that, or you know, in harmony with nature, the way that polytheism should be. We have to we have to ask ourselves if we want to worship life or if we want to worship death or something that is beyond our existence. And I choose to worship life and this cosmos and this world and this nature and not something that is beyond this. So that's what we have to ask ourselves. And so let's instead go. And look at nature what does nature do and what does that tell us how we should practice our spirituality spirituality again is not about clouds or bearded men it's about your own growth like i said a rose bud wants to become a rose and you too should find yourself and become the best you can be the best version of yourself that is spirituality it's nothing else the the so so let's focus on what's here and now and like i said it's it's nature and yourself yeah so um beautiful, beautiful if you, i have uh i have some more time if you have and uh, i know maybe you had some more questions but uh it's up to you if how long you want to keep the, um, the podcast is there anything that you want to ask tina so much really but um i'm i'm thinking i'm just going to join the discord 
<laughs> you should you should oh, well, no, but you know that there's uh in our discord server there's so many really really um knowledgeable people and uh, th these are the kind of discussions we have and and we teach uh, authentic rituals authentic astrology authentic everything so so yeah please come and, and join yes absolutely i will i will share the links on my own social media as well good pretty Thanks. sure i know plenty of people who'd be interested in that and again please uh invite me again if you wanna if we want if you want us to to uh, or be more specific on a on a certain topic or or something like that i'd be uh thrilled yes we will we will plan that very soon thank you so much for joining us bjorn it was really exciting and interesting to have you here and uh, I'm sure you're going to get a flood of new members on the Discord server. Hopefully, hopefully, because that will make the, like I said, the world uh, a more ordered and beautiful place. So that's um, that's perfect. And next time, maybe you will see my uh, my uh, beautiful face uh, in front of all my wine bottles that I have uh, brewed <laughs> here in my home. So, um, so let's see if there's a next time then. Yes, definitely. Okay, well, I'm going to drop all of your links below. Um, thanks for joining us, everyone, and we'll be back soon.